Okay. My paper is, is concerned with uh, taking us back a little further in time, at looking at Jain images um, from the very origins of image making as we know it in Jain art, um, back to the early centuries uh, AD, and in some cases uh, marginally earlier than that, though dating is problematic, um, and to look at the way in which um, Jain imagery uh, emerged in India in a very early uh, phase of every, um, image making in the Indian subcontinent, um, and how central Jainism was to the very beginnings of image making, um, along with the two other principal uh, traditional religions, shall we call them, of, of ancient India, that of uh, early Brahmanical uh, teachings, uh, Hinduism, uh, and, and of course of Buddhism. Uh, the Jinnah, uh, as Dr. Gradoff uh, mentioned, uh, was broadly speaking contemporary with uh, Sakyamuni Buddha. Um, their lives overlapped, we believe, in the, in the fifth century uh, BC uh, in eastern India, uh, circulating in Bihar. And there are many parallels uh, between uh, the uh, visual representations and the iconog iconography that's adopted in both religions, a uh, great sharing of visual vocabulary, whilst at the same time having a different uh, theological intent. Now, the representation of the Jinnah um, is problematic, um, and there certainly was a debate in Jainism, as indeed there was in, in, in Buddhism uh, in its early, uh, early centuries, as to whether one should be representing um, the, uh, the person of the Buddha or the Jinnah uh, in uh, physical form at all. Uh, and theological uh, debates uh, raged around this very issue, um, and uh, we see it being resolved in, in Buddhism relatively uh, early, um, but it also seems to have been addressed um, uh, in, in Jainism uh, almost at the beginnings of image making uh, in India. Um, there's every reason to believe that the uh, earliest um, figurative representations uh, of uh, divinities in India uh, may well be associated with Jainism uh, rather than one of the other uh, traditional early religions. Uh, but the, the question mark, the issue of representation persists right down into the present day. Uh, we see images such as the one on the screen, which is uh, a small uh, portable uh, shrine, perhaps dating to the 18th century, um, but there are others uh, dating from the 20th century of the same uh, type, in which the jinnah is represented by a void by the absence of image. Um, and here we have the standing uh, uh, jinnah in um, uh, body abandonment posture, um, standing ab above uh, uh, or on, uh, represented to imply that he's standing on the lotus uh, uh, pedestal, uh, sheltered by a royal uh, umbrella, honorific umbrella above, and two fly whisks left and right of the image. This is, in a sense, is the ultimate uh, Jain image of uh, absence. And jinnahs are absent for a very good reason, um, because jinnahs um, uh, raises similar theological issues as, as we find in Buddhism. Buddhism, uh, that jinnahs are, uh, 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 present a problem in terms of uh, popular devotional worship, because the jinnahs are uh, thoroughly detached. Uh, they cannot um, intercede or intervene um, or respond to petition or uh, prayer in, um, in the way that Hindu deities uh, have this capacity. Um, and so we find um, that a whole cast of subsidiary deities uh, were necessary in Jainism. Um, and these were drawn up and adopted from traditional and very ancient cults, uh, animistic cults, uh, absorbed into a broader pantheon uh, to provide uh, this accessibility uh, on a popular, popular level. The, um, the Jains were never shy about representing, uh, presenting in the most spectacular manner um, their uh, images. The temples themselves um, reflect the wealth of patronage that occurred uh, throughout the history of Jainism. The Jain community uh, in India historically has been numerically really very small, um, but a prosperous one, uh, one drawn to non-martial professions, uh, the principle of of ahimsa, of nonviolence, is the overarching uh, guiding principle to Jain ethics, uh, religious life, and daily practice. And so uh, this, uh, this excludes certain professional activities and ensure that Jains uh, engage themselves in aspects of passive, passive professions, shall we call them, forms of commerce, uh, of banking and finance, and so on. Um, the result of this is they uh, earned an enormous position of trust in India through history. Uh, routinely, uh, Jains would find themselves uh, serving as ministers of finance in Hindu and Muslim courts, for example, an almost unprecedented level of trust being extended to someone outside a ruler's own community. Um, and 
the wealth that they accrued through these activities uh, was poured back through uh, a philanthropic um, uh, position, if you like, which is also central to Jainism, the principle of non-possession. Um, so even those who pursue an active and successful uh, lay life um, must also then give back to their community. And this has resulted in one of the most sustained bodies of art production in India, quite disproportionate to their numbers, um, and we have a great legacy dating back um, to over a period of 2,000 years, um, which reflects the achievements of the Jains. And what I want to do is take you through a range of images dating from the very beginning of art production in India, much of which is Jain, uh, through into uh, later historic periods. I begin with uh, just with these images of, of, of abundance, 11th, 12th century, um, uh, temple, the uh, Vimala uh, Temple, one of the many shrines at Mount Abu um, in Rajasthan, uh, uh, seen here in a late 19th century uh, photograph. Uh, the temples themselves uh, were spectacular, uh, large structures, and dare I say, fortified structures. Uh, the Jains were living uh, often with, with the, under Hindu rule, uh, certainly in Gujarat and elsewhere in later periods uh, under Muslim rule. And so uh, they've had to behave both politically very astutely to ensure they were not persecuted um, and also um, nonetheless um, build their temples in a manner which could um, provide some level of, of security. <clears throat> now, the Jinnah images are represented in two principal forms, and it's a challenge when one comes to look at Jain art to, to, to identify what degree, the degree of variety that can be found within the tradition. Uh, people th tend to think of the Jain tradition as being simply the 24 Jinnahs who are largely indistinguishable, and this remains, uh, remains true. Um, their representations in either this uh, standing body abandonment, which is not simply standing but in a, a, an advanced meditation posture, um, is, is very, very common and represents the earliest form of Jinnah representation in India. Um, we have this represented in uh, images from around the second century AD. Um, and the second, of course, the seated meditating uh, form, which plugs into a much broader pan-Indian and very ancient uh, tradition of representations of practitioners of advanced uh, yoga, yogic practitioners. Here we have these standing uh, figures. Uh, these belong to uh, Digambara, uh, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, these are the sky-clad, those without clothes, who pursue total renunciation of possessions, uh, represented here nonetheless with all the honorific attributes of a, of a ruler, of a chakravatan, of a ruler on earth, uh, here with honorific umbrellas, uh, with fly whisks, and other, other uh, decorations of rank. Um, so detachment, nonetheless, using the regalia uh, of, of kingship. Um, the, the second sect, of course, are the Svetambaras, um, uh, who are uh, traditionally, uh, Svetambara literally, white-clad sect. Um, and you, you have to take a few moments to study the images to really uh, know which you're looking at. Um, the, the standing Gadambara, uh, naked is, their nakedness is very, very evident. If the seated images, it's less immediately apparent. Uh, this, in fact, is a clad image, so a Svetambara image. You'll see the form of the dhoti of the waist cloth here and the pleats uh, of the robe coming out beneath to tell us this is a Svetambara sect uh, image. Solanki dynasty, 11th century, uh, Western India. Uh, the representation of the 24 Jinnas is problematic. The great um, commentary, the closest thing the Jains have to a Bible, the Kalpa Sutra, um, deals, uh, which is essentially a heliography, as it provides biographical information of all the Jinnas. Um, uh, and although they're all uh, theoretically equal, um, others are, some are more equal, clearly, than, than others. Um, and the, the uh, Kalpa Sutra concentrates on the first Jinnah and the three most recent jinnas. So beginning with Rispanath, <coughs> the very earliest of the jinnas, um, who we see here on the left uh, with his long uncut hair, unusually here uh, represented in this recent 12th century image, um, piled up rather in the Hindu manner. This is the Jata Mukata hair worn by Shiva and other. This is the uncut dreadlocks that you see in Hindu imagery uh, here. Uh, uh, rather than cascading down on the shoulders, which is more typical, is here given a Hindu treatment. So we have the first of the 24. His origins lost in the mists of time. And paired with Mahavira, uh, the great hero, uh, the most recent of the 24 Jinnas. Um, and uh, the the 23rd and the 22nd, Pasvanatha and Nemanath, we will come to in, in a few moments. Um, but this uh, image from Arissa uh, really um, 
I think epitomizes the uh, importance of the founding jinnah uh, and of the most recent jinnah of our historic age, uh, Mahavira. And so uh, Mahavira, um, is, is, from the fifth century BC, is seen really as, as, as the effective founder of Jainism as we know it uh, today. Um, the, his predecessor, Pasvanath, the, the snake-hooded uh, standing, uh, pas, snake-hooded uh, uh, Jinnah, um, who almost certainly was a historically verifiable figure, probably dating to the fifth or sixth century BC. Those that precede him, the other 22, are completely lost in the mists of history. The story really begins with the early image on the left of your screen, this great image um, of uh, the body abandonment standing, the image of Rishpanath, the first of the jinnas, here with his long uncut hair uh, cascading down on his shoulders, uh, the exaggerated proportions of his arms um, indicating his uh, protracted and prolonged um, standing meditation. Exceedingly beautiful copper alloy uh, image uh, from Chosa in um, in Bihar, in eastern India, uh, dating to around the second century. Part of a horde of Jain imagery uh, which was recovered uh, many years ago uh, and preserved uh, in, in, in Patna Museum. On the right, I show you the same subject from a thousand years later, from the Deccan, uh, from Karnataka, a 12th, 13th century uh, image. And you can see the way in which the evolution of the image uh, uh, has not moved all that much. Um, this is uh, still a very powerful um, and beautiful, highly stylized uh, representation of the standing uh, austerity meditation uh, jinnah. Um, from the same site that the uh, earliest uh, uh, Rispanath we just saw came from, we have this uh, very beautiful um, wheel of the teachings, the Dharma Chakra, um, here with very clear uh, aquatic associations. The wheel is supported by uh, two uh, very spectacular um, makaras, and uh, then with what we would, I think, rightly interpret as a water spirit animistic figures uh, here. So, so close sort of water associations. Um, the Dharma Chakra, uh, a symbol, of course, indicating teachings uh, shared not only by uh, shared between both Jainism, of course, and, of course, Buddhism. And it's interesting that the, the emblem of the wheel uh, as symbolic of, of the, 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 the teaching of the law, the spreading of the Dharma, um, uh, no, no doubt linked to the, uh, the, the visual, the language associated with the Chakravatan, the divine ruler who would travel the extent of his uh, kingdoms by chariot. Um, so the, the wheel uh, took on this particularly uh, potent um, um, message as, as a symbol of divine teaching, to the extent even that when um, stupas, for example, were built uh, both in Jain and Buddhist contexts, uh, we, the excavations of some of the very earliest stupas have revealed the Dharma Chakra uh, symbolism built into the very foundations of the structure, so that we have the wheel as the embodiment of the law uh, embedded uh, in the ground plan, if you like, of the stupas themselves. There's a very clear intention to embody this uh, magical symbolism in into the fabric of, the, of these um, uh, important early um, religious uh, monuments. The, um, in many ways, one of the most important early uh, representations we have of Jain imagery, in fact, the place in which we find what are arguably the earliest uh, Jain images that have come down to us, are in these uh, very curious stone slabs which appear to have functioned as uh, votive offering plinths, if you like, uh, small stone slabs uh, placed horizontally um, which contain a, a group of all the auspicious emblems common in early India, many of which uh, had a long afterlife in Jainism, um, including the swastika um, and various aquatic uh, symbols, the double fish symbol and so on, the tree ratna representing the three jewels, uh, which has a, a two sets of meaning, one in the Buddhist context, one in the Jain context, um, and so on. The three ratnas here uh, encircling um, the image of the seated uh, Buddha. This is almost certainly the earliest uh, representations we have of jinnas um, and provided in a highly uh, symbolic, dare one say, quasi-magical uh, diagram 
Um, and this uh, vocabulary, which was present at least from the first century, um, persists right through uh, into the present day. And we see uh, the use of the auspicious emblems uh, being used on small uh, votive and uh, votive trays, which are placed on the uh, uh, low tables before images in Jain shrines in which devotees can make make offerings uh, and uh, and offer their offer their prayers. Now. Many people have asked me in the course of uh, the exhibition we've had on uh, upstairs, uh, but how do you really distinguish an image of a jinnah uh, from that of the Buddha? Um, they're meditating, uh, they're scantily clad, um, and they um, have auspicious marks in some cases, a skull protuberance, maybe extended earlobes, and they can look very, very similar. Um, and this, uh, what is very clear from the very beginnings of image making in North India, particularly centered around Matara, the great uh, production center uh, of the Kushans uh, uh, in northern India, uh, the, cent the city described by early Greek geographers as the city of the gods, uh, clearly renowned in antiquity as a, a, a place in which many faiths were practiced, uh, uh, cohabited uh, within this one, one city under a very uh, tolerant um, uh, regime. So I have, for example, on the left of the screen, um, an image of a Kushan period, probably around 150 AD, more or less, um, image of the Buddha. Um, and if you look at the plinth on which he is standing, the uh, lion-supported um, throne uh, with the symbols uh, being worshipped at the center, we have, the, in fact, the wheel uh, being celebrated here, uh, supported on the tree ratna, the three jewels representing the Buddha, uh, his teachings, and his community of monks, the Sangha. Um, we see the same symbolism here, and to all intents and purposes, we assume, you would assume this is an image belonging, uh, a fragment belonging to a, a Buddha image. In fact, the in inscription uh, tells us otherwise. The inscription tells us, in fact, this belonged to a jinnah. Um, and it's very clear um, that the, um, uh, the visual language being used in the first and second centuries AD was essentially identical. Uh, it begs the question, of course, which came first? Um, and we, it's by no means certain that, that Buddhism always preceded or prevailed in these matters. It may well be that Jainism uh, took a lead in many of these, of these areas. So we have the wheel as an embodiment of the teachings uh, appearing in the very earliest figurative images in the uh, 100s uh, AD, um, and um, in both Buddhist and then uh, what are definitively uh, Jain contexts. This relief um, was excavated at Matara, at the Kankali Tila site, which is a site predominantly Jain, um, it's a suburb of Matara, um, predominantly Jain site, very important material. And this fragment is, is in fact uh, inscribed uh, and dated to, this dated in fact um, to the twelfth day of the, of the fourth month of the rainy season um, in the year 79 Saka era, which gives us 157 uh, AD. So we know precisely uh, when this was made, and we even have some idea of the weather. Um, and it also tells us um, the name of the donor. Uh, it was a female donor, a devotee called Datta, um, and she was responsible, and we may reasonably assume she is one of these, uh, perhaps the, the principal figure represented here with other members of her family, um, the women on this side and presumably male members on the other, possibly a monk um, um, uh, in attendance. A very important piece of, 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 of evidence uh, to show that the conflation of imagery occurring uh, between these two, uh, these two religions. Um, the representation of uh, donors, of patrons, uh, occurs then throughout Jain art. It's one of the best documented traditions in India, in fact, for um, information on, on donors in, in, in art. Um, and this is a 13th century image from Gujarat, dated 1299, um, in which um, a male and female donor couple um, are worshipping, uh, now uh, the inscription tells us it was worshipping an image, not now, now detached, not surviving, um, presumably um, an image of Rishpanath. So uh, th these donor scenes become very, very important, uh, often carry donor names, and, and often carry uh, more, more significantly dates uh, important for art history chronology. Now, one of the most spectacular instances in which uh, imagery is shared by all three faiths of ancient India uh, is the image of the goddess of learning and wisdom, of Saraswati. Um, she, a well-known figure to all of you today, if you follow modern Hinduism, so indeed Buddhism, uh, Saraswati uh, is the embodiment um, of knowledge, of, of, of supreme, holy, um, sec um, religious knowledge, um, and, and, and um, 
supreme wisdom. Um, she is shared by all the early religions, and the, but the, it's interesting that the earliest representation, uh, dated representation we have of her is in fact this very large uh, image that stands over a meter in height from Matara, from the same excava excavation site as the pe uh, pedestal base we saw a moment ago, um, in which um, she is represented here in this squatting uh, posture, uh, attended by both, uh, would seem both a, a donor figure here holding a, a, a vase, maybe a money pot of some sort, um, and, and a, a, a spiritual um, a devotee, a, a acharya, a religious teacher here in, in the robes and hands raised in Anjali, um, uh, revering the goddess. Um, and she carries only one attribute um, that has survived to us, um, and that attribute is seen here, and this is the palm leaf manuscript. It's the book, uh, the palm leaf folios, uh, then bound between wooden boards, um, and you see the binding cord um, uh, lashed around the, the, the binding, the, the covers uh, to preserve. So the book as the embodiment um, of, of knowledge. And so this is her symbol. Uh, this is what she in her, herself is the personification of. Saraswati, in a sense, has become the personification of the, of the texts that she carries uh, as, her, as her symbol. Um, very, very important. This also gives us a clue um, of the importance of texts in early India, of the physicality of the text, of the physical manuscript, not just the oral tradition in which knowledge is passed down through uh, teacher to pu pupil, uh, through... through um, uh, retention and, uh, and mind learning, but the physical book itself and the importance of of yana puja of knowledge wisdom of knowledge worship, um, which becomes very much an important part of Jain religious practice in later periods, uh, may well go back to the very earliest uh, times that we uh, can document. So a very important, uh, spectacularly uh, significant uh, image, uh, dated 57 AD, Saka era, dated equivalent to 132 uh, AD. Uh, we then have a series of quite remarkable early uh, jinnas, um, uh, which uh, show us the origins of, of the jinnah image, uh, directly parallel with, with early Buddhist image making uh, in northern India. Most of the action is happening uh, in uh, north central uh, India and in the Gangetic uh, plains. Um, uh, Jainism had its origins, as uh, has been mentioned already, in, in eastern India and in Bihar, uh, but it's thought that by at least the third century uh, BC, uh, those communities were severely disrupted, perhaps by famine, it's not clear, um, and there were mass migrations um, both west uh, to Gujarat and Rajasthan, where the largest um, community of Jains survived to this day, um, and south into the Deccan, into, to, particularly into Karnataka uh, state. Um, and so they spread in these two directions. Uh, principally to the west um, uh, went the Svetambaras, the white-clad, principally to the south went the, went the Digambara, the sky-clad, but not exclusively, but that was the, the trend. Um, so we have early images from Matara, uh, this uh, very beautiful um, early image of the Jinnah showing all the attributes, very Buddha-like, dare I say that, except he has this identifying chest mark, the Srivasta mark here on the chest, uh, which to my mind uh, is uh, it's seen as it's simply an auspicious mark associated with knowledge, um, but in many ways I suspect may well have uh, arisen in visual representations as a, a, a an opportunist way in which they could distinguish the two images, remembering that most of the Im early image making in uh, the workshops in Matara in the second, third century AD were almost certainly um, responsible for making, um, the workshops themselves were responsible for making images for all the faiths uh, of the day. These were secular workshops. Um, they would work to commission. So they would be producing Buddha images and Jain images in the same workshop at the same time. There's no reason to, to, to doubt that. Unlike some of the later Buddhist production, which we know was happening in a monastic com context, for example, uh, not, not only monastic scriptorium, where the manuscripts were made under, by monks, uh, but also at Nalanda and elsewhere, the great Mahaviharas of medieval eastern India had bronze foundries. We know they were casting on site within the monasteries. These were you know, big production centers um, for, the, for, the, for the Buddhists. For the Jains, we're not sure. Um, there, there are general uh, t textual prohibitions on the making of imagery uh, by monks and nuns. Uh, whether these prevailed through history, we're not, we don't know, but the, the medieval texts which allude to this make it very clear that it's inappropriate 
for a monk or a nun to engage in making images because you're making, uh, as Dr. Granoff may so eloquently explained, you're making images of great beauty and therefore by implication uh, uh, sensuous images. And the concern was, as is expressed in the texts, that to make images, for a monk to make an image or a nun, would be to arouse sensual thoughts, inappropriate sensual thoughts, uh, in the, and therefore they should stay away from this disturbing activity and leave that to the layman uh, to do. And that appears to, as far as we can tell, appears to have been the case. <clears throat> so it's a very early, very beautiful, probably mid-second century um, image uh, of the Jinnah uh, as a, uh, the auspicious mark of, 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 uh, on, his, on his chest. And then we have a remarkable image here, early third, uh, perhaps or third or beginnings of fourth century, uh, again from Matara, uh, an image of Nemanath, the third, 22nd of the 24 Jinnahs. A uh, very important image, in fact, uh, because it shows and gives us some idea of the origin of many of these early uh, images. Uh, Nemanath is represented here. Uh, we have at the base um, the, the animal supporting, the, the wheel again, the Dhamma Chakra, um, uh, emblematically uh, represented there. Um, in later uh, iconographic forms, um, Nemanath is represented by the conch shell. Each of the 24 assume a, a cognitive sign, uh, but that's not always present at the very earliest period. Uh, so here he's represented, and he's flanked by two attendants. What's remarkable about th this is uh, he's flanked by two early Brahmanical gods. On the left is Balaram, um, uh, who has a later life in, in the, in the um, Krishna stories, and on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the left as you see it, and on the right as you see it, the image, um, a representation of very early <coughs> form of uh, Vasudev, who um, over time um, evolves into the, the figure we, we all know and love as Krishna. Uh, so these are very early Vaishnavite cults. Um, these are the early Bhagavad um, Bhakti cult images, which had their origins in the centuries BC in India, closely linked to um, Yaksha cults, animistic cults in the early centuries BC. Um, this is the beginnings of the most important early cult imagery uh, in India, and here we find them, these two Vaishnavite um, deities being subsumed as attendants, as submissive attendants um, to, uh, to uh, the Jinnah Nemanav. Very important image. Um, what's interesting is shortly after this, in the, by the 5th or 6th century AD, this reference is gone. Uh, these Vaishnavite deities drop away. Um, Balar Balaram um, has, a, has an afterlife in Jainism as, as Baladeva, uh, but as an independent um, uh, secondary deity. Um, and and uh, the association between early Vaishnavite imagery and early Jainism is lost purged perhaps, suppressed, uh, we don't know, but it disappears uh, by the end of the Gupta, uh, Gupta period. Um, we then get other images which have direct parallels um, with Buddhism. You could read this as, if were it not for the, uh, the nakedness of the, the figure, um, the explicit nakedness of the figure, um, and the Srivasta mark on the chest as a Buddha and two attendant uh, Bodhisattva or um, uh, Chauri figures, Chauri bearing figures, fly whisk figures. Uh, the Jinnah here is uh, represented on the lotus, has the honorific umbrellas, celestial adorers in the clouds. Um, and uh, two attendants with uh, uh, fly whisks, uh, which uh, associated with, with, with royalty, um, and, um, and then, of course, the pearled uh, radiant nimbus, all the symbols associated with a, a royal cult image for this um, Digambara Jinnah image. <coughs> This is a monumental uh, figure. This is one and a half meters in height, um, a very large and powerful, very beautiful uh, uh, image of the Jinnah. Again, from Matara, from Kankali, uh, Tila site, dated to around the fifth century, um, now in the Lucknow Museum, uh, one of the most spectacular uh, pieces to have come down to us uh, from this time. Very, very beautiful. And apart from the uh, chest markings, virtually indistinguishable or effectively indistinguishable uh, from Buddha images of the period. And then we have this very beautiful, what we call Sanath style, if you like, um, uh, Jinnah, uh, which we have direct Buddhist parallels, uh, some of the great late Gupta images of the Buddha from Sanath, um, uh, directly analogous to this very beautiful meditating uh, Jinnah represented here. 
<clears throat> the formula be uh, becomes well established into the early medieval period, uh, and so we, we have images like this from um, northern Madhya Pradesh or maybe uh, Uttar Pradesh uh, around the 11th century, a very beautiful image of Rispanath, again with his long uncut hair cascading down on the shoulders and with two fly whisk attendant figures and uh, the usual celestial uh, attendants. Uh, this becomes your standard image that appears in, in the great temple building programs of medieval uh, northern India in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. <clears throat> Now there's a parallel tradition going on in, in, in making images associated um, uh, with, uh, with small portable icons for use in uh, small household shrines and for presentation, presentation images uh, for uh, gifting to, to temples. <clears throat> and I show you a, a very beautiful uh, image of um, Nemanath um, in this collection here at the Met, um, enthroned on a high pedestal, um, with attended by uh, two uh, uh, animistic figures, a yaksha and yakshi figure, um, and the, these are the uh, principal um, uh, yaksha deities, uh, nature cult figures uh, used to serve the jinnas. In in Jainism, they appear. Uh, both as attendants to the jinnah, and as we'll see in a few moments, also as independent cults, and have very particular reasons for that. So Nemanath in deep meditation, attended on the left um, <coughs> by, by the yaksha uh, Gomenaha, and on the right, uh, the yakshi, the female, with the standing infant, uh, image of Ambika, um, always linked to uh, Nem the jinnah Nemanath probably dating towards the end of the 7th century, uh, associated uh, stylistically with a group um, founded at Kota uh, near Baroda in Western India. This is another piece uh, which is uh, definitively known to belong to the Akota horde, uh, a very beautiful uh, Svetambara image. He's dressed, uh, again, with the same attended uh, Yaksha Yakshi figures uh, here. Uh, again, the two deer at the base worshipping the uh, Dharma Chakra, the wheel, which we see uh, edge on here rather than in profile. Now, uh, we've mentioned uh, uh, the importance of the 23rd jinnah, uh, Pasvanath, uh, and this is a very clear case in which the jinnah images uh, draw heavily on indigenous uh, animistic cults. Uh, Pasvanath, seen here in meditation, uh, uh, protected by the uh, the hood of the um, Naga, the Naga king. Um, uh, he, he, well, his meditation is in danger of being, uh, being dis disrupted. A very beautiful image um, of Pasvanath, the Nagaraja Dhanarendra is, is, is protecting him, and um, the Nagaraja's wife, the Nagini Padmavati, is seen here supporting the umbrella, honorific umbrella, and she's identifiable, of course, with the uh, uh, snake-hooded canopy over her head. Very beautiful, and beautiful, very beautiful and very benign image of Pasvanath um, uh, as the great um, uh, Jinnah, uh, protector Jinnah. Now we have another image of the same deity, um, <clears throat> a little later in time, uh, dating probably around the 10th century, uh, from Uttar Pradesh, uh, quite remarkable, um, because it shows a, a very different interpretation of the same subject. Uh, there's a sort of ferocious, complexity to the, to the, to the work. Um, the, the image of Pasvanath uh, protected uh, from the forces of, of, of evil that are descending upon it. Uh, you have these scenes of, of chaos and madness represented uh, around, um, directly parallel to those images many of you will know of the, uh, the Buddha in deep meditation uh, being uh, calling upon the earth to witness his resistance of the distractions sent by the forces of, of Mara uh, to, to, to uh, both the, the temptations and the f armies and, and, and the horrors that are sent to destroy uh, the Buddha's meditation. This is a, a work very much in that same vein. I would suggest it's a work directly in, inspired by the, the Buddhist versions of this subject, uh, here given a particular rendering uh, in a Jain context. A very rare interpretation, in fact, of the Pasvanath image. Again, the honorific umbrella uh, being supported by uh, the Naga's wife. Um, the, the use of the Naga imagery has a long ancestry in India. It goes back to the, some of the very earliest uh, uh, cults. Uh, this is a Kushan, uh, uh, a fragment of a Kushan sculpture um, of Bararam, um, who we saw a moment ago with Nemanath in that very early Vaishnavite associated image. Uh, here we have uh, Balaram holding the, the, the club and, and um, 
what I think can be interpreted as the plow. Uh, his early associations are with agriculture, and we have this very curious motif here, uh, which uh, I suspect is a plow associated with the very early uh, stress on the early agrarian, importance of agrarian activity in early India just as the other great uh, stress in early imagery, particularly associated with Christ Krishna, and his, his importance so early in India uh, is with pastoral activity, with, with um, nomadic pastoral activities. We have this, these two uh, central uh, core activities in India, both, both farming and the, the, the um, husbandry of animals, um, as then generating cults uh, which support and give su sustenance uh, to these. And then we have this great image, this beautiful image of Pasvanath um, uh, in, the, in the 12th century, um, coming from, uh, uh, from uh, Karnataka, uh, from, from, the, from the, the Deccan, a very large image. We very clearly get this, the protective snake represented spiraling be behind the, the image of, 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 of Pasvanath. Um, very, very beautiful. A long inscription in Canarese, South Indian uh, language, with, with, uh, northern un, uh, with Andhra Pradesh and, and northern uh, Karnataka. Uh, the inscription is very, very revealing. Um, it not only names the donor, one Mali Seti, um, but also, in fact, names the sculptor. This is exceedingly rare. Um, that occurs most frequently in, in, the, in the Deccan, in fact, in Hoysala uh, temples, um, but it's a very rare uh, phenomenon, generally speaking. Uh, the sculptor is named Chakravati uh, Paloja, um, and um, we, in fact, have a third, another inscription on this sculpture, which is slightly later. Uh, it's got the letters C. McKay, uh, 1806, uh, very boldly engraved on the back. And when this sculpture was under my care um, so at the Victorian Albert Museum, where I worked previously, um, this information was not recorded. It's only when I uh, put the, prepared the object for exhibition that I discovered these in initials carved on the back. C. McKay, 1806, has to be uh, Colin McKenzie, uh, a very famous uh, servant of the East India Company, um, a great antiquarian, um, uh, who, uh, one of, like William Jones, who founded the Asiatic Society, um, collected, uh, recruited a pundit, learned Sanskrit, um, collected manuscripts, and collected art wherever he traveled. Uh, and this was clearly collected by Mackenzie, uh, passed through the East India Company, ultimately arrived at the V&A. Um, so uh, fascinating uh, history to this uh, particular object. The inscription also tells us that it was commissioned uh, by the the named donor uh, as a replacement for an object that had been vandalized. And we know something about the history of the period, and we know there were uh, Muslim incursions into this area, and uh, we can probably, uh, we can reason, quite reasonably link it to a, a particular period of, of, of civil disturbance, uh, and this appears to be the object made to replace a similar object, presumably, that was destroyed uh, during a sect sectarian conflict. Um, now, Beneath the image, you have these two uh, attendant figures. And we've talked a little about the Yaksha and Yakshi figures already. Here they are incorporated um, as attendants, submissive attendants uh, to, to Pasvanath. Uh, but they also then assumed a, a status of independent cults. So here we have the same um, uh, Yaksha and Yakshi deities represented in full-scale full um, icons, um, quite independent of, the, uh, of, of, of a jinnah. Quite a remarkable pair um, of images, uh, which are uh, uh, also coming from 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 Karnataka, from central uh, India, from the Deccan. Um, and then we, uh, quite rarely, in fact, but we do get uh, large-scale cult images, as you see on the left of your screen, <coughs> of in fact the snake himself. This is the personification um, of of. of uh, Pasvanath's great protector of the Naga king, Dharanendra, uh, seen here uh, standing as an independent cult image. And so not only are the jinnas uh, uh, revered and, and, and as, as, as great role models in, in Jainism, but the, um, the uh, supporting deities, of which there's really a very vast uh, cast of deities, uh, serve to provide a role, uh, a way in which the devotee can, can access um, uh, uh, spiritual benefit, uh, get uh, responses to prayers and petitions. 
Um, the most popular of these perhaps is Ambika, you know, the mother goddess, every religion has one. Um, Ambika is the Jain mother goddess, as seen with the standing infant here, um, holding the mango, which is her, um, uh, one of her attributes. Um, interestingly, that the term uh, for mango, uh, the Sanskrit term for mango, mango Amra, um, has very close um, phonetic associations with Ambao, the uh, Hindi word for mother, mango, mother, um, may, may be an in, a confu um, coalescing of these two meanings uh, into the choice of the mango as her principal attribute. This an image of Marissa around the 12th century. Yeah. And then we get Saraswati persisting through. Uh, this is a dated 13th century uh, image uh, here on the right-hand screen. And I just show you the uh, second century one we started with earlier um, to show you the continuity running through these, these images. Uh, there are occasions when, when the identifying symbols associated with the jinnas, in fact, uh, become uh, dominant. So we have this very uh, striking, um, actually miniature image uh, of Nemanath here, uh, in which he is actually standing on his attribute. So this large-scale uh, conch, um, festooned with ribbons, um, it becomes the vehicle, if you like, for Nemanath uh, in this Degambara representation. And here a very complete uh, representation from Arissa, um, of um, Rispanath, the very first of the jinnas, with his long uncut hair again, treated in the Hindu manner, in the Jatamukata uh, style, uh, with the, the bull at the base, his, his cognitive symbol. <coughs> now, um, I want to sort of move on fairly quickly because time is, time is passing. Um, uh, this spectacular bronze, this uh, image is a, a dated image from 1168, is in fact the largest bronze Jinnah image outside India. Um, it, it's um, a spectacularly large and beautiful image. Um, the image itself, 12th century, the surrounding nimbus uh, may well date from a later, later period. We also get images like this small uh, lotus mandala, an articulated lotus, um, a, a motif we see most, meet most frequently in Buddhism, uh, here being treated in Jain context, a rock crystal image of the jinnah installed within the uh, articulated petals uh, of the lotus. Uh, and rock crystal, of course, is the material which can transmit light and the embodiment of the material most associated with purity, appropriate material in which to represent um, those of pure soul, um, the jinnas. And these are Buddhist versions of the same, uh, rather more elaborate, uh, Buddhist versions of the same uh, device from Eastern India. And here are the cosmological uh, representations of the Jain universe, which Dr. Granoff spoke about earlier. I won't uh, linger on those. Uh, here you notice we have the, the void silhouette representation here with the realized image of the Jinnah. But within that, a, a meeting of the very first image I showed uh, and the, and the, uh, the three-dimensional images coming together. Uh, that same cosmology appears in mural painting right down into uh, the later medieval period, is Jain temples near uh, Kanchipuram in South India, uh, in which we get the same cosmological representation given in a two-dimensional uh, mandala form. Now, I want to just sort of go, go quickly uh, to uh, the art of the book in India. We have some remarkable evidence for, for the art of the book from the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, uh, this image here is, below is a, a 12th century uh, Gujarati ruler who actively commissioned uh, manuscripts to be distributed, to be propagated uh, throughout his kingdom. Um, and I show you an example of uh, some of the royal endowed manuscripts, um, it's very elaborately painted wooden book covers uh, in which contemporary scenes have been represented, usually scenes of very famous theological debates um, and um, shown in a series of vignettes, a sort of continuous uh, narrative uh, in which uh, these particular events um, take place. Um, some are to do with great sermons, some are to do with theological disputes, uh, some rivalry between the different sects, Svetambara, Gadambara, for example, and so on. Here's some examples of the covers, uh, spectacularly beautiful examples uh, on, on the upper section uh, from the LD Institute in Ahmedabad. Um, and from um, the Deccan, where the Digambara is concentrated in the south, um, an example of some of the earliest surviving Jain palm leaf manuscripts uh, from Madbidri, uh, dating from the late 12th, 11th and 12th century. I show you this seated jinnah with attendant figures and an analogous uh, bronze of the same uh, period. Uh, you can see how closely the imagery of, of sculpture and, and illustrated manuscripts were, were, were meeting here. 
Um, and this manuscript, um, also from Mudbidri, uh, is actually a dated manuscript to the 1125, as I recall, uh, and is the earliest dated Jain manuscript uh, in existence um, on palm leaf. Um, and he, rather like the earliest Buddhist manuscripts that we know of, not so much storytelling, not so much narrative, much more using images of deities as a talismanic presence, as a protective uh, presence on the manuscript. The storytelling uh, come, appears to come in the illustrated books a little bit later. Um, one particularly uh, beautiful uh, book cover, which I'll show you a small detail, here uh, tells the story of Bahubali, uh, who is not, not a jinnah for reasons that remain uh, very obscure, um, because he was a much rever revered um, superior uh, uh, person um, who renounced violence after a, a bloody war of succession uh, with his brother um, and retreated into the, the woods to meditate um, meditates so long, in fact, that the, the vines grew around his legs and the, the birds made nests in his hair and the ants built anthills around his ankles, and he expired in meditation in the forest. A uh, very popular subject, seen in manuscript form, seen in our collection, in, one, in the earliest bronze that is known, dated by U.P. Shah, the great authority on, on the subject, to the late 6th or early 7th century. Um, very, very uh, spectacular um, not spectacular in scale, it's about five inches in, in height, but enormously important early representation. And it's this same subject, some of you may well know, that in the 10th century was uh, chosen to be represented by, by uh, commissioned by a general, in fact, in the Deccan, um, uh, for the, the largest rock cut sculpture known in India. Um, the, at Shravana Belgala, um, he carved a, a monumental version, um, uh, some, some f close to 60 feet in height of this image, which is, was then celebrated and continues to be celebrated on a 12-year cycle um, of, of temple festival um, and a place that attracts great numbers of pilgrims to this day. The most recent one was in 2005, 1.2 million people attended a great encampment, um, and they witnessed the daily uh, lustration of this image, of this 40-foot rock-cut version of this image um, in, this, in on, honoring of Bahabali. Not a jinnah, but an exemplary uh, a human being. And then we have some very beautiful um, early palm reef manuscripts. These are from the, some of the bandhas, the monastic libraries in, in Patan, uh, 12th century, uh, uh, maybe Hemachandra teaching or perhaps dictating to a scribe. Um, very beautiful early examples of illustrated palm leaf manuscript. Um, a, a, a nobleman or king having traveled on an elephant and then uh, to a shrine to venerate the jinnah. Um, very, very evocative and beautiful uh, images. And just some details to give you a sense of the style of these early manuscripts. We progress some, at some point in the 12th century from palm leaf exclusively to palm leaf and also works on paper. You have paper coming in principally from Iran, uh, additional new colors and new pigments also coming in from Iran and from Afghanistan um, and, uh, and extending the repertoire. So linear, uh, very beautiful linear uh, treatment, silhouetted forms, uh, very st powerful, strong palette of intense uh, saturated colors, reds and yellows, and, and uh, in some cases some lapis lazuli for the blue um, to create these very powerful images. Here is the Jinnah uh, we saw earlier plucking out his, uh, plucking out his hair um, and the god Indra uh, gathering up the, the locks of hair as they're, as they're cast down, part of his uh, uh, formal renunciation. Um, and here give you a sense of how the paper manuscripts continue this tradition, very beautifully illustrated with these uh, cameo-like paintings uh, set within the, the sections of text, um, the little uh, marker, red, red marker spots, which tell us that these, these manuscripts originally um, are copies of, not copies, they're in a continuation of the tradition of illustrating on palm leaf, but here on paper, and so instead of the binding hole in the, in the palm leaf, you have a painted uh, hole here, not literally a hole, a painted representation of the hole as a memory uh, of that uh, history of the manuscript. Two from our own exhibition, um, very beautiful representations of the Mahavira's uh, uh, father um, talking to the astrologers, learning of the, the, the foretelling of the birth of Mahavira, and here the infant newborn uh, Mahavira in the lap of Indra, being venerated by the gods in Indra's heaven, um, made a, a quick diversion from his time on earth. Um, here again, um, uh, the revered teachers uh, in, in exposition, uh, teaching at the um, 
to, to, to their followers, both uh, other monks and to lay, lay devotees. Um, these are very spirited and enlivened images, um, richly in, in de, uh, embellished with uh, expensive mi mineral colors, uh, and in the 15th century, increasing use of gold, uh, gold often replacing black ink uh, for the text. Again, as, uh, this is conspicuous consumption. This is, uh, these are wealthy patrons um, commissioning the deluxe edition uh, of the books to then present to their own temple uh, as an act of merit. Just to give you a sense of the continuity that's taking place here, we have a 16th century uh, image, uh, manuscript page, in which we see the, uh, the scene, the very famous scene in the, in the life of Maravira, in which the, uh, the, the embryo of, uh, of the future Maravira is transferred from uh, his natural mother to his foster mother, and Indra, uh, on whose instruction this happens, uh, sends his um, uh, goat-headed uh, ambassador to do this, delicate operation, and we see him literally transferring the embryo here. Uh, this deity who persists right through uh, into modern day Jainism, a uh, very important figure in the history of the life of Mahavira, we see in sculptures from 2,000 years ago. This is a Kushan period, late Kushan period sculpture in which this uh, goat headed, they vary a little goat or animal headed uh, figure um, is seen as a protector of children. Uh, got little, little infants are here clinging to the head of the others by the side. Um, this is one of the early uh, animistic um, protectors of figures, particularly associated with childbirth. And then we get um, this wonderful painting, um, which I, um, I've always enjoyed. It shows the monk, a monk resisting the temptations of women. Here he is in a meditation, in a body abandonment posture, with these very beautiful women dancing around him, but maintaining absolute detachment um, uh, from, from the distractions this might offer. And just for interest, below is an image of a 12th century uh, palm leaf manuscript, a Buddhist manuscript. Um, it's a, a variant of the Prajaparamita text. Um, and I won't take time now to discuss the, the content, um, uh, but, but simply to, to make the obvious stylistic uh, parallels between what's happening in 12th century um, uh, Buddhist manuscript painting um, and in Jain manuscript painting uh, a couple of centuries later. Uh, use of the flat, saturated red ground, the formal frontality of the, the figures, the use of black lines, silhouette, and so on. Very close stylistic parallels. And then to conclude, uh, the image you've seen already of this very uh, beautiful folio um, uh, from the famous um, 1465 Jainpur um, manuscript from uh, UP, from northern India, uh, showing the uh, auspicious the dreams of Mahavira's mother, and clearly an example of the sort of deluxe uh, editions uh, produced uh, through the patronage uh, of the larger Jain communities. Thank you. <laughs>